welcome first online. Oh, we have okay. Ivy Ouyang, Chief Executive, OCBC Wing Hang Bank. And then let's welcome on stage, Lawrence Vanderloo, Executive Director, Technology and Operations, Asia Securities, Industry and Financial Markets Association. And Dennis Chu, Chairman, Hong Kong Singapore Business Association, Executive Director, Far East Consortium Hong Kong. And moderating the conversation is Sulin Tan. Over to you, Sulin. Morning, folks. Don't worry, you've only got 40 minutes to a cup of coffee. That, that is the guy. Um, no, this is the girl. This is always a very interesting topic, isn't it? Interna okay. you know, international hubs, and we're, we're sitting here in Singapore, and we're not supposed to compare it to Hong Kong. Um, I, I just want to say that my panel is uh, uh, they're your best people to talk about this today because we've got representation from the corporate side. We've got Laurent over there who speaks for financial members across the board. And then we've got Ivy, who is um, uh, head of a major bank. So um, I think they're well placed to talk to you about this issue. Now, last year on the, um, let's let me make, make sure I get this index right. The Global Financial Centers Index. So Hong Kong dropped a notch from to, uh, place number four and Singapore's up at three. Now that got everyone into a stir. Um, but Financial Secretary Paul Chan got on his block and started to write about it, you know, explaining why, you know, we're, no, we're not in competition and so on and so forth. Now, I thought maybe to discuss whether Hong Kong can stand out as an international hub and financial center, we'll do a little compound contrast. So um, we don't pick favorites around here, but if we were to pick some favorites or discuss the centers, and it's not just Hong Kong and Singapore in the region. Um, who would you pick? I'll ask the panelists, but I'll start with Laurent because she has a bit of data she would like to share before she tells you who her favorite child is. Sure, thanks very much. Um, and thanks for having me uh, and to SCMP for putting this great event together. So my name is Laurence van der Loe. I work for ASIFMA. And so um, as a moderator said, we represent over 160 um, member firms, which are financial institutions from the buy and the sell side, um, as well as the wider ecosystem um, to work with them and the financial regulators in, in Asia to develop capital markets. So it's in that capacity that we've worked closely, not only with the Hong Kong and Singapore regulators, but also the ASEAN regulators, etc. Um, and indeed, thanks for mentioning um, the, 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 the index. Uh, we've actually done our own um, survey and, and a SIFMA capital markets survey, which we've now run uh, for two years. Um, and we um, asked 37 um, global and regional financial institutions for their views about the um, market developments, the operating environments and the regulatory environments in the various jurisdictions um, in the region. Um, last year, we ran the survey over summer, so I think that might also color the results. Um, and indeed, um, in terms of the ranking across these three factors, Singapore, interestingly, Singapore, Australia, and then Tokyo came first, uh, and Hong Kong came fourth. Um, last year, Hong Kong had a second place um, after, after Singapore. Um, but again, I think um, looking at the time uh, when those questions were asked, I think that definitely um, factored into to the responses. So it will be interesting to see what, what we get this year. Um, but just to share, and I'll focus on Hong Kong and, and, and Singapore, in terms of the top attraction factors that those 37 respondents um, shared, um, for Singapore, it was the political situation, uh, the fintech developments, and the predictable and transparent regulatory uh, policies. Um, the pros for Hong Kong and top attraction factors were the workforce uh, and the skills. So interesting, uh, was interesting to hear what the, the previous panel had to say, the trading and exchange infrastructure and the tax environment. Um, whilst on the impediment side for Singapore, it was the uh, perceived stricter immigration um, policies, market liquidity and debt uh, and outsourcing regulations. And for Hong Kong, the political situation growth rates um, and international sanctions. So that's from, from the participants and uh, keep, yeah, happy to share my personal view uh, later as well. Yeah, just one, one question before we go from that. You mentioned um, Australia and Japan as you know ahead of Hong Kong in that survey. What were the attraction for them in those two countries as financial hubs? 
Um, so I just shared the the, the attraction. Um, um, I can share some of the attraction factors. I need to take the stats with me. So for Australia, whilst it is a very domestic market, I, mean, I don't think our members and the participants saw it as an international financial center. But what they do well domestically um, is on the workforce skills. That was really one of the top um, attraction factors the trading and the market infrastructure and the stable regulatory policy. Um, for Japan, quite similarly, actually to Singapore, stable political situation, infrastructure, market liquidity, and, and the policies. But I'd say they're, they're not international, not as financial, uh, international financial centers as, as Hong Kong and Singapore. They're, they're domestic, um, domestically focused, and, and Tokyo has really been struggling um, to reinvent itself as an international financial center for, for quite some time now. So if I was an investor, where would I get my bang for my buck, you know, amongst those, I mean, talking to the survey uh, respondents, is there a preference? I mean, obviously, they've got different, you know, they've ranked the, the cities, but, you know, if you really want bang for your buck right now, is there a certain city that they should go to? I, I personally hate that question. I know. I, I just on, on me personally. I lived. Uh, I lived in Hong Kong for ten years. Uh, I love the place, uh, and I moved to this incredible place, uh, Singapore, a year and a half ago. And when people ask me on my personal life, which which place you prefer, uh, I don't like answering that question because they're they're so they're, both places are different, and I have a role to play. Um, and it goes to your question as well. Um, I think they both have their strengths. So depending on what you're investment, investing in, what business you're in, um, there, there's probably uh, pros and cons to both. Um, and I think what both places have to do is double down on their fortes. Uh, for Hong Kong, I think that's their equity markets. Um, so if you're in equities, um, Hong Kong, and yeah, I think the Honorable Paul Chan um, shared some great statistics yesterday about the size, liquidity, and depth of the equity markets in Hong Kong and the growth potential. Um, as well as the China connectivity. There's no other place that can um, can bring the China con connectivity as, as good as, as Hong Kong does. Uh, and whilst for Singapore, it's like it's it's a massive effect center, for example. It's the place uh, for wealth management and asset management. So that would be my recommendation to, to the two centers and the investors is to double down on, on those four days. Well, here's a perfect time to ask Dennis because he represents investors and corporates so he's got a bunch of money he wants to put somewhere so he might tell you where he'd like to park his cash or raise capital or do business so how would you you know where how would you do it would you split it would you focus in you know one center is there a, a strategy involved okay, let's just backtrack a little bit sure okay can i just ask the audience here how many people have been to Hong Kong in the last six months? Well, it's a fair amount. It's a, if I had I asked this question before COVID, I think it's everybody open up their hand. So my advice, uh, just to take the, some of the questions that uh, from the previous uh, group. Uh, I advise all of you should go back to Hong Kong as soon as possible. Uh, because honestly, some of the questions just now was being asked, I, I found it pretty uh, interesting. Let's, 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 let's say the least. Okay? okay, let me just go back to what you say earlier. Okay? Yeah, there are many index survey around the world. Okay, but just to quote your one, the, the Global Financial Center Index. Singapore came third, China, uh, Hong Kong came fourth. But what's actually even more interesting is that uh, Shanghai came sixth, Beijing came eighth, and Shenzhen came ninth. Despite all the difficulties, the uncertainties, the how many stones throw at us, collectively, the major financial centers are in this part of the world. I mean, okay, London, there is New York. So as a corporate, you ask me where I put my money, uh, uh, I say Hong Kong is a good bet because now Hong Kong is done. Just, just to do a bit of advertising. In the last two years, we spent 10 billion Hong Kong dollars to buy land because it's not easy for Hong Kong land price to go down. So that shows you a 
bit of corporate thinking and if you are not able to read business cycles then i think it's very hard for us to move your business forward but in the last few years wow well, it's been incredible right i mean all the black swarm the, the war the covid interest rate gone from zero to five percent and how we do our business plan and we're in properties we have to close a few hotels just to just to say that we're doing upgrading but actually we just closed hotels you know so so, so what do you, what can you do when you open is open and we can't find enough labor the number of stones has been thrown at the corporate world has been incredible you have to up we we all have to up our learning curve uh, to be able to survive in this new world. So I still think Hong Kong is still a very good bet. I think Singapore, no need to say already. I think Singapore is uh, is the winner from COVID. Save money, save security, save health. So without doubt, as the, as the minister say, three three trillion US dollars AUM is now in Singapore. So these are the two winners, I think. But Dennis, you haven't answered my question yet. Where will you park your money? I think I, I've said it because we spend that kind of money in Hong Kong. So we we are betting in Hong Kong. We are parking the money in Hong Kong, even though that we do business around the world. And we, th we think that there will be a strong rebound in Hong Kong, but just that people don't know it. But if you have the foresight, I advise you to go Hong Kong. I mean, about half the people have been to Hong Kong in the last uh, last six months. But I'm, I'm no doubt in the next six months, probably the whole room will have gone back to Hong Kong. You know, um, Lorana was saying there were so many positives for both hubs that we're just talking the two, Singapore and Hong Kong here right now. But is the magic for Hong Kong the standout, that connection to mainland China? Is it the physical flow, the Hong Kong connect, the capital flow? It, is, is that the main draw for you so that you have access to a much larger market that perhaps Singapore doesn't have or any other markets in the... Yes. I think each one have its own uh, attractions. Hong Kong, without doubt, is getting closer to China, greater Bay Area, uh, close to two, two trillion GTPs, 80 million population. Uh, Singapore, ASEAN, around 650 million people, uh, three trillion GDP. I think both FS and the minister said that actually we are in a very lucky spot because I mean the, the world, the geopolitical, the geopolitical uncertainties around the world has basically split the East and the West. But then I think the East from the economics point of view seems brighter. So I think both, I mean, you know, this, uh, I will look at both. So. I was just talking to Ivy before this, our panel, and we were talking about, you know, how Hong Kong Exchange has, you know, expanded the connect and, and really to introduce relaxed listing rules to try to attract more investors. Now, it seems to me that that's what their key focus is, and that's the, the, the point of difference. Uh, Ivy, do you think that's the case for you that, you know, um, is the bank trying to do more things, introduce more products to attract more investors into Hong Kong, and that, and that the focus again, as we were talking to Dennis before, is is the connection to to China. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Sulin, for the question, and thanks uh, South China Morning Post uh, for the opportunity for me to share this subject, which is very passionate uh, about it uh, myself. So before I answer your question, uh, let me take a step back. So, uh, uh, you know, I for over, I cover the Hong Kong business, Hong Kong and Macau business for uh, the OCBC group here in Hong Kong. As you probably know, CBC is 
a bank based in Singapore. So we definitely will have all the capability we built in uh, Singapore in head office already. But our bank is very committed to build Hong Kong as the twin hub. Uh, what does it mean is whatever capability we have in Singapore, we also build in Hong Kong, whether it's risk management tools, whether it's you know transaction banking, global market capability, product and channel, we'll build that here. So we're putting money where uh, our mouth is. So why would we want to do that? Uh, I, I think it's mainly feedback from customer. What we see that while Singapore have a lot of strength, uh, I'm sure you have heard in the last two days already, but Hong Kong has also its draw to quite a lot of company. I mean, whether in the treasury center and the corporate side or asset management company, we are seeing the demand here uh, so that uh, we will definitely put quite a lot of uh, effort to build the capability here and continue to improve our capability so that we can help our customer to meet their financial goals. Now, on your question, uh, Celine, I think, I think uh, if you look at what the Hong Kong government is doing, is pretty smart, right? It focuses on where we are unique. Uh, as uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. Paul Chen said, it's not a competition, it's actually each have its advantage. Uh, I think uh, I can't say it better than Laurent just now on, you know, the advantage of Singapore and Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong government has been putting quite a lot of effort in the China Connect when nobody else can do that. And, and that's where we, uh, we see the customer are attracted to that and they are continuing to fine tune it. I think the reason uh, proposal from Hong Kong Stock Exchange to say international company trying to list it in Hong Kong can also join the Stock Connect, uh, which means they can take it to the China investor market as a big draw. There are other, you know, uh, fine tuning or should I say transformation that Hong Kong Stock Exchange is driving, like the Swap Connect. We're also applying for the license because it will allow in Hong Kong and international banks to uh, have more risk management tool and participate in the onshore uh, derivative market. So there is quite a lot of things they are working on, on top of the existing stock connect and bond connect. And I think that is a very smart move, focusing on where we are very unique in Hong Kong and no one can replicate. Right. Is the bank producing or coming up with new products at all in the near future that can help some of our investors in this room? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. As I said, uh, we are committed to this twin hub strategy that uh, we will have the tools, the products to help our customers to manage their risk and, you know, uh, generate more revenue. Uh, maybe in the transaction banking area, the payment area, as well as the global market area, as you know, what we've seen, uh, you know, recently, a lot of volatility in the market. Uh, a lot of our customers want help to see how they can manage their risk. So that area, I think, will will build more capability to have our customers. All right, just hold your hold on to that thought about risk. We'll come back to that in a second. But I'm going to ask Dennis. Are there any products you'd like to see the banks come up for your businesses or for, you know, your peers? For the banks? It, for yourself. Like for what, myself. What sort of products would actually help businesses? Well, I hope they can lend me money fast. <laughs> That's always good. Ivy, you heard okay. that? Okay. Yes. Well, well, we'll connect you separately, <laughs> Dennis. Well, you're my banker, but, uh, you know, this is uh, okay. But, but your side that, uh, uh, I think to, anything to speed up the speed of transactions and the safety of the transactions. I mean, if you can walk into our, our property and say, I want to buy a property, and if the bank can instant approve and pay digital money into my account, that would be really fantastic. <laughs> if they can book our hotel, you come in and you just swap 
and the, uh, the entire transaction is done. But I literally think it's coming. But I think the whole flow of digitizations uh, is not some scientific uh, uh, things that is, you think is, 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 is going to happen. It's, it's happening. And I think each one, we just keep up with our own your own business or your own content of your business or your own product and i think to me the rest which should flow in uh, because I, I mean i'm not in technology I, I i don't know how to manage all this technology but but i can't but to say that the the flow of things is now is, is like a wave it's just catch right? that's that's how i see it yeah, perfect. So, you know, sorry. Yeah, oh, maybe just to, to add to that, I think it's a, a great point about like the, the, um, the speed of transactions, digitalization. I think it's actually a very important other area where Hong Kong and Singapore need to collaborate, maybe friendly compete, but certainly also collaborate on. Um, this world is already fragmented enough. The last thing that we want is Hong Kong and Singapore each driving their own um, international payments, etc., digital platform agendas. Like ultimately, again, that competition is good, so everyone stays on their toes and and continues to innovate. But in the end, we want ultimately, hopefully, globally, but at least regional interconnected digital ecosystem with Hong Kong and Singapore as the drivers and also collaborators for that. Yeah, hold on to that mic there. Um, Dennis was talking about you know, instant approval for com commercial property loans. Well, that's in the eye of the storm at the moment, isn't it? Because we're talking about a banking system crisis at the moment and, and commercial property loans are right in the eye of that storm. So, he, you know, without referring just to commercial property, but it would be remiss of us not to talk about the contagions potentially coming into the Asian Financial Center um, here in, in AP. Uh, but what do you think, Lauren? Do you think, do you think that's a problem? Do you, are you seeing contagions coming through? Are you are you seeing your um, members concerned about the health and resilience of Asian financial centers? Um, it's a good question. Obviously, a lot has happened over the last couple of it seems weeks, but it's actually only we're still talking in in, in days. I think um, obviously there was SVB, uh, Signature Bank, um, Credit Suisse um, last week, but I think um, the Asian financial system is really quite resilient, um, strong balance sheets, both the Hong Kong and the Singapore central banks um, came out with very clear statements confirming um, the health of the bank's balance sheets, um, the high capital and liquidity coverage ratios. And I think that was also reflected actually in the financial markets. Um, whilst obviously there's been a lot of volatility, the Asian indices were actually down a lot less um, than you EU and UK, uh, sorry, the EU and US one. So that's a reflection of that. Um, and I think it's also because the, the 1997 Asia financial crisis is still fresh in mind of, of, of many uh, central bankers as well. So there's been a lot of prudence here um, in the region. What I would say though, is I think what became going back, actually I may segue a little bit into to crypto and Web3 and digital assets, it became quite clear from um, Signature Bank and SVP, the risks of uh, an entire nascent sector banking with a handful of, of players. Um, and I think the there is an issue in Hong Kong and in Singapore for those Web3 players to open corporate, even payroll uh, bank accounts. So they're, the risk of all of them all working with certain players and then in the case of signature bank that player going down or SVB is obviously a risk which is, the HKMA actually is already addressing earlier this week they organized um, a summit or a round table with hong kong um corporate bankers to to start to address that problem right and ivy would you agree with laurent that the balance sheets of banks in asia are fairly healthy and liquid liquidity is robust and, and yeah. also yeah go on no, no, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, the regulator has come out and uh, confirmed that they won't uh, dare to say that if it is not true. I think they are very on top. They look at us, uh, all the banks, uh, very closely. Uh, you know, I, I think this, uh, I 100% I agree with Laurent, it's very good point. I think banks should, now with all this, changes that is happening is actually uh, 
uh, my worry is the, the regulation will be even tighter uh, with, with some crisis happening. Uh, in the past few weeks, we already answered loads and loads of questions from regulators and the board of directors. So I hope, I hope it's still early day. I hope it will not be further tightened. Uh, 100% agree with Laurent. We sh the bank should collaborate a lot more to help uh, you know our customer to to manage risk, to have healthy balance sheet, so that we can support our customer to have the meet their financial goal. I mean, uh, the 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 wish and hope of Dennis, and actually, indeed, mo most of our customers they want instant service very good prompt approval. So it's a balancing act. How do you do it? Facilitate a good transaction, but be able to stop and prevent bad transactions is you know, what we try our best to do. And with all this new technology, it's getting more and more possible. But, but you know, most of the banks are also looking at with speed of movement of money much faster, and decision much faster. How do you uh, manage risk better at the same time? Uh, and uh, we, we continuously look at how we can manage this uh, better and by trial and error. The regulator is very helpful. They give sandbox, they give a, you a lot of, they encourage you to try the technology in a safe environment before we launch it. So that's something uh, we're working on as well. So I'm just going to challenge you on one thing. Property, particularly com commercial property, has been very hot for a very long time. In fact, we've talked about asset bubbles for a very long time. Now now it's come back, the, the chooks come back to roost, so to speak, and, and then we're now talking about those issues again. Now, how do, you, how do you speak for the bank in terms of your commercial property loans? You know, Asia loves lots and lots of these loans, and, and, and Dennis here would attest to that. Can you tell our audience you know, how will you how are you managing risk around your loans? Are there any risks at, at all? Well, absolutely, there are risks. With this sort of interest rate level, we, um, you know, even last year, we we're doing stress test after stress test to look at, you know, when we grant the loan on commercial property, we have certain assumption on the interest rate level. It's completely different now. We look at stress tests, we look at all sort of analyzing, forecasting customers' repayment ability. So yes, absolutely, the short answer is yes. But I think fortunately, uh, uh, the Hong Kong MA is very tough in terms of how we learn against property. It's not just the so-called in Cantonese a thumbhole or, you know, learn against the property, but they look very tight on, you know, cash flow, repayment, you put stress tests there, even if interest rate go up, can they afford to pay? That's sort of good measures. Uh, I rarely I will praise the regulator, but on this issue, uh, I think that impose uh, in, in they impose a stress test actually have a lot. We have buffer, so even when the interest rate go up, customer need to pay more, uh, and property price may go down. Uh, the risk is quite manageable at this juncture. Now, of course. Uh, we will need to be careful, uh, you know, what will happen if interest rate further increase. But I, I think it's risk, but it's a manageable risk. It's manageable. And what do you think, Dennis? Do you think there are risky commercial property loans out there in the banks? Are you comfortable with your loans? Very. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why. How, but do you think you know, being well-buffered? Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, for, for sure, the, there's a huge amount of risk. I mean, why I say very, I mean, it's, I'm a, we're a public company, you, you can just look up our accounts, it's, it's very simple. Uh, in the last few years, what stress, what stress test can you do when you have zero business? What, bis, what stress can you do when there's a war? And what stress test can you do, I mean, those who do numbers here, to do a interest rate from zero to five percent, you know we build, you know, we do our liquidity model for eighteen months to three years, but nobody in our wildest dream that has come from a no inflation or deflation uh, risk to a hyperinflation to an interest rate risk of five percent. 
So we just need to be really, really prepared for black swan. I mean, you know, how can we expect Hong Kong to have gone through those last few years with all the demonstrations and then followed by COVID and now it's still standing? I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So, so I think that reflects how we all should do our businesses. It's, uh, you know, it's just, just be prepared for the unexpected. I mean, you know, the only stress test we have is to build cash flow. I mean, that's the only, only thing that we can do is, uh, you know, is keep as much cash as we can. But then even cash today can be risky. If you look at the Credit Suisse, you know, <laughs> so, so that's really, so, so I don't know, sometimes you don't know, you don't know where to hide. I mean, that's, that's the, one of the greatest banks in the world with, I mean, before it happens, like 14% tier one uh, capital, and it can drop like a stone. And I think we just need to be, I mean, I'm, I'm not in technology because some, some of the technology guys, they don't need to make money to keep alive. Right. But my business that if I don't keep money, if I don't have enough liquidity, I won't be alive. So, so, so it's a very different thing. Just focus your own business and to see that the black swarms is, in, is, in, is happening increasingly frequent, just like our weather. So, you know, just, I think, just be careful. I, I think what you said there is key. Cash flows, important. Cash is king. And so, but is there such a thing? And, and it's a good thing that it sounds like our Asian banks are doing really well on the liquidity front. Everyone's very confident about that. Now, the thing is, is there such a thing as too much capital, too much cash coming into the region? Is there such a thing as, you know, a bubble of too much capital? Is that possible? You know, what do you think, Lauren? Is that at all a risk? Yeah, it's a good question. Cash is king, probably the diversification is queen then. Um, yeah, it's I think the investors are, are, are smart enough and those diversification um, opportunities do exist in, in the region, so. Okay, well, I might ask, Ivy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I uh, to answer your question, Suleen, I, I, I don't think too much capital or too much cash is a problem. It's how you deal with it. Uh, that is the problem. And if you saw some of the bank, you know, because they have too much cash, then where you invest, do you lock yourself too long term or you prepare for the liquidity based on, you know, I think Dennis give excellent advice that, uh, you know, that's probably part of the Asian culture that we always prepare for the rainy days and would not gear up to the uh, maximum to, you know, uh, make sure that we have the liquidity. I, and I think that is, uh, is very, is a lot of wisdom in what he advised because I, I have been in banking industry for more than 30 years. Uh, I, companies gone bust because, not because they lose money. If they lose money one or two years, they can get back. They gone bust because they don't have cash. So liquidity is the key. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably what we've seen from a lot of customer trying to, now recently we got a lot of requests to open account with us. And when we asked them, they said, oh, I need to manage the concentration risk. I don't want to put everything in one basket. So that's quite a, it's an uh, but it's interesting. We see a lot more those uh, activities now. Yeah. That's interesting. I think the investing culture is quite different across different regions. Can I just get uh, one more point? Uh, please, uh, please. Uh, I don't want to scare everybody. It's uh, okay, you build up your security, your safety, but doesn't mean no business. <laughs> no, definitely. I agree. Definitely. I, I think, I mean, what I, I mean, we, let's speak for, you know, different parts of Asia Pacific, in Australia, New Zealand, there's been a big commercial property bubble for a very long time. And it, it all stems from liquidity, too much money and nowhere to go. So, you know, so you have, you know, lots of people taking up loans, buying up buildings. And then, you know, there's an asset price, asset bubble issue that's been percolating in different parts of the region. But as you said, different investing cultures create different kinds of balance sheets. So um, speaking of risk, and we might finish off on this, that is the question, um, and, and perhaps all of the panelists might be able to speak to this. Uh, 
the ongoing geopolitical risk of a China-Taiwan tension, perhaps, you know, would Hong Kong and its financial center be caught in the eye of that particular conflict? Uh, Laurent? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one, right? It's a, it's tough days that we're living in uh, with a lot of geopolitical tensions and, and sensitivities. Um, as we as we speak, the Taiwan leader is in the US, so it remains to be seen what will what will come out of that. Um, but I think, and, and Singapore, it's not just Hong Kong, right? I think, um, so I think for Hong Kong, the key will be um, to keep focusing on really one country, two systems, common law, et cetera, and, and again, double down on that. But and and for Singapore, it will also it, it's they, they've always played obviously the the neutral uh, role, the the Switzerland of of, of Asia, um, and so far like they've they've weathered that storm uh, and navigated that minefield very very well. So it will be yeah interesting to see how how Singapore as well as, as Hong Kong continue to to navigate this increasingly complex world. So you're comfortable if things should break out as an issue across the Taiwan Strait that you would. Think that the center like hong kong as a center will hold out let's just hope that will uh, <laughs> never happen <laughs> okay and what do you think then dennis you have an eye in these things well, it's so tough to be a business guy this year you have to read you have to be a geo i mean have, have to be a politician and you have to read uh, geopolitics i think my simple answer is that if that happens all bets are off uh, uh, i think the business will be affected not just Hong Kong, but the whole world. Mm. Um, and I think just uh, buy gold. So that's my advice. <laughs> buy gold. Here, here. Investment idea number one today. Buy gold. <laughs> I, mean, I can't think of anything else for, for a quick answer. <laughs> but, but are you managing any risks around this potential conflict? Is this something you're factoring into your governance? I mean, as I said, that. Uh, With the increasing faster business cycle, we need to build up our security and safety. In my business, because it's capital heavy, so we build up liquidity. So I don't know each one's business. You have to look for your own angle in your own business. Just be more careful in whatever you are doing and build up that safety. But as I say, this doesn't mean there's no business. So you still have to carry on. Uh, with that. I think you've given away the secret tip there. Be careful. <laughs> um, and Ivy, um, yep. any, uh, are you managing this risk at all in the bank? Or are your peers doing any management around that <laughs> risk? Yeah, before, before I answer that question, Selena, I just want to give you some uh, data. We were talking about this subject with the with the Director China team and my, our Taiwan uh, general manager actually shares some interesting statistics. If you look at Taiwan's foreign direct investment, it has been increasing. Uh, you know, last year, you know, it's, it's on the rise in, instead of on the reduction. That's number one. Number two, most of those foreign direct investment is actually from U.S. companies, big companies in U.S. So. Actually, uh, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, this potential war, is it a media hype or is it a real reality? If those big U.S. companies think that there will be a war, will they increase their foreign direct investment? So I, I'll leave it at that. I think we all can, you know, think through the probability of that. Now, but, uh, you know, I just said that Asian culture is we will prepare for rainy day. So, of course, we will look at you know, how we manage that situation if things happen, you know, diversification of risk. Uh, I think, you know, uh, everyone will look at that possibility, how, however remote, but uh, doesn't mean we stop our BAU business. That's, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, I think we can finish off on the fact that there is a media hype. Be careful and please buy gold. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can we get a quick photo for our panelists? Thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, seated. Let's do a seated photo. All right, Ivy, give us a nice big smile.
Great. Thank you so much again, Ivy, Laurent, Dennis, and Sulin. Thank you. All right. We are now going to take a short coffee break. So 